Okay, good afternoon. I'm Alex Mozed, founder and CEO of Applico and co-author of Modern Monopolies. Today we are on Winner Take All, where we talk about all things tech. And to start it off, I'm joined by Nick Johnson, uh, also co-author with me on the book Modern Monopolies. And we're going to jump into some foundational content around what is a platform business. And a lot of people use the word platform very differently. Uh, probably 99% of the population uses the word platform to describe a technology or a product. But on this show, the way we're going to use the word platform uh, is to describe the business model of platforms. And basically what the platform business model is, is it's a business that doesn't own the means of production. Instead, it owns the means of connection. And it creates value by facilitating the exchange of value between two or more different users, usually consumers and producers. And as a result of that, it has these things called network effects and these things called uh, winner-take-all dynamics, hence the name of our show. So for the first time ever in history, uh, we have data that was in the book from 2016, which shows for the first time ever, were the top five companies by market cap actually all platform businesses and actually all the same business model that's never happened before. Um, additionally, if we look at some examples of platforms and their winner take all dynamic, if you look at YouTube and the amount of content that is consumed or the amount of engagement on YouTube versus say that of Netflix, what you'll find is that uh, the engagement on YouTube absolutely trumps that of Netflix. Netflix has sponsored a bunch of research that says there's more bandwidth used on Netflix than uh, anywhere else. That's probably true. But when it comes to amount of engagement, amount of uh, hours of video consumed, YouTube is absolutely the winner take all uh, player in, in that space. Um, other examples would be Windows for desktop operating systems. Pretty straightforward there that that is definitely a winner take all uh, type of business. Um, another example, if we look to China, let's look at Alibaba. Let's look at uh, their various product marketplaces they have around Taobao, Tmall, and others. Um, they have a majority of the share of e-commerce in China. JD.com would be the number two. JD.com traditionally has been linear in the sense that they buy products and then they resell products as, as like a traditional retailer would, but online. Over the past few years, JD has been moving more towards a marketplace model. Uh, like Alibaba, like a platform model. And as a result of that, their market share has been increasing and margins have been improving. Um, other famous example would be search in the US. If you look at Google, uh, they are massively the monopoly player in uh, search, both in the US and outside of the US. No question there. Um, and then mobile operating systems with just iOS and Android. Although iOS may have fewer devices in the market, when you actually look at the amount of spend on apps, which is the platform dynamic for an operating system, right? People uh, buying third party apps and the money they spend on them, it's actually about 50 50 between the money spent on iOS apps versus Android apps. Um, so, why are these platforms able to have a winner take all dynamic? Why are they able to have such great uh, dominant positions in the market? Well, they get that scale that, that I'm talking about. Um, which comes with these network effects, right? That gives them this defensibility, this moat that really makes it much harder for anyone to compete with a platform, right? Uh, no one wants to be the Windows phone going up against uh, iOS or Android, or for that matter, uh, Amazon tried with the Fire Phone. Um, Facebook also tried, I think, with a partnership with HTC and uh, Huawei. If they want to try, go for it, but you'll be the fourth failure. Um, other attributes would be that these platform models are actually asset light in the sense that the inventory doesn't actually sit on their balance sheet. Uh, so they can essentially complete a core transaction and facilitate that exchange, but the inventory actually never needs to uh, be possessed by the actual platform model. All of that basically rolls up to say that they have higher margins, um, which no one can complain about. So uh, the literal definition, right? Platform business is a multi-sided business model facilitating exchange between two or more inter interdependent groups. Lots of other ways that people use the word platform, whether it's a 
uh, product family on a car or the Intel chipset um, these, or, or, or infrastructure as a service. These are really speaking about platform in the sense of a technology or a product as opposed to the business model. Um, what is not a platform would be uh, what we call linear companies on this show. So uh, linear companies, you're going to hear that a lot. Linear companies are companies that are, you know, buying raw materials, uh, doing some work on them. That could be a GM buying raw materials, manufacturing and assembling a car and then selling that car. That could be a Macy's buying products and then reselling those products in their stores. Uh, one commonly confused company would be Netflix. And Netflix is not a platform. Why is Netflix not a platform? Well, Netflix spends about $10 billion a year, a lot of that debt, um, creating their own content or licensing that content. And what that means is that all of that inventory is essentially on their balance sheet. And that means that they don't have a supply side network effect. They have a lot of consumers. They have a lot of people paying subscriptions and, and watching video clearly. Um, but they don't have millions of third-party content creators like YouTube does. And what that means is that Netflix over the next few years is not going to be able to have as strong of a defensive position that a content platform would like a YouTube um, when more competitors come into the space. And as we're seeing that today, whether that's AT&T, HBO taking away uh, friends and other you know premium content that Netflix used to be able to have. Uh, Comcast is now getting into the game. Disney is getting into the game. There are much lower barriers to entry when you don't have a supply side network effect, uh, which linear companies, by definition, don't have, including Netflix. Um, so I'll put a pin in it there, and let's shift to some some kind of topical news these days. That we what we hear a lot about still a linear company would be Walmart, and um, as a refresher. A few years ago, 2016, Walmart bought Jet.com. In um, 2009, Walmart actually tried to create their own marketplace. Um, it was called Walmart Marketplace. And that failed. Why did that fail? Um, mainly because it was too close to the mothership of Walmart. The traditional core business of Walmart stifled the new disruptive marketplace model. And it wasn't able to take off. Doug McMillan came in a few years ago as CEO of Walmart um, and really made a big bet on Mark Lore and uh, acquired his company, Jet.com, for about $3.3 billion. A couple interesting facts with um, that acquisition. So to pay for that acquisition, Walmart opened the fewest stores in 25 years uh, because you can't continue to just spend billions of dollars on the existing plan of opening new stores along with buying and, and making these big acquisitions. Um, then, obviously, they bought Flipkart for about $16 billion uh, shortly thereafter. And that's the dominant marketplace in, in India. And within 12 months of buying Jet.com, they had huge growth in the amount of products listed on Walmart. Pre-acquisition of Jet.com, they had about 15 million SKUs online. Post-acquisition, within 12 months, they had 60 million SKUs online. So they had added an additional 45 million SKUs of inventory. Walmart didn't go and buy 45 more million SKUs of inventory in 12 months. But what they did do is enable third-party sellers, get access to a bunch of additional inventory. And that meant that they had a wider product catalog for the customer. And you can also bet that the 15 million SKUs that they already had were just that much more price competitive in the sense that now a bunch more sellers can also post prices and and inventory that would compete with Walmart's internal uh, buyers and sellers that, that were overseeing those 15 million SKUs. Um, so Nick, what happened recently? What Last week, there was a big article from Recode or Vox, I don't know, whatever you call it. Um, you know, what, what's the kind of the summary of, of what they talked about there? Yeah, so the, the article came out last week from Vox, uh, which I think owns Recode. And they basically, this article, said that a lot of people in the core business of Walmart are essentially rebelling against the success of Mark Lohr's e-commerce team. Uh, they've basically gone and folded Jet.com's team or in the process of folding it into Walmart. And a lot of the people in the core business are jealous or upset or angry that Mark Lohr's team has basically been given the ability to go lose a billion dollars. Uh, 
uh, on $22 billion of online revenue, roughly, which, you know, for, a, for an early stage e-commerce company trying to compete with Amazon, in context, really not that bad. Uh, but in the context of Walmart's traditional business and the metrics and everyone else has to perform by, very different than what they're used to. Uh, so the article basically said that you know, the, the board, uh, the leadership team, and a lot of the uh, other division heads within Walmart are unhappy that Mark Lohr's team and the online team has gotten so much credit for being successful in growing this online business while it's still losing money. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, Doug's got a tough job. I mean, how, how do you culturally change such a big and successful company um spend all this money bring in the jet.com team into the executive management of walmart and lower down in the ranks um and and culturally you're gonna have clashes the, the one interesting thing i thought i mean there's some easy stuff that could be fixed here like um the head of the u.s market uh what was his name the head of like Walmart US, he is comped on the overall P&L for Walmart US, which includes the losses from Mark Lohr. So I could see that being you know, an argument to say, well, maybe you should separate this out or maybe you shouldn't necessarily penalize this guy. And, you know, I, I'm sure that would help. Actually, you know, the money always makes a difference no matter what you say. Um, but the other stuff, yeah, I would agree with you. I mean, it seems I would say whoever's leaking this probably has a little bit of a bias. Yes. Uh, I don't think the Mark Lore team was going to recode and saying, hey, guys, let me <laughs> let me tell you all about what's going on. Um, it, it sounded to like the, the people that were jealous about the credit that uh, Mark Lore's team is getting were some of the sources potentially for this story. Right. The one thing that I would, which, which was odd to me and I haven't really made sense of is all of the acquisitions of linear e-com startups like Bonobos, ModCloth, Eloquy. Those aren't marketplaces. At least I don't think they are. Yeah, those are all linear startups. I think the idea there is they needed to jumpstart their SKUs. They're still, even with going 15 to 60 in a year, they're still hundreds of millions behind Amazon. Yeah. And I think the strategy there was, can we get unique, more premium kind of brands that consumers know? Uh, and put it on the marketplace to jumpstart that. I think part of what you have been seeing and what this article says, as well as that strategy hasn't uh, been working as well, uh, particularly if you judge those acquisitions by the traditional kind of metrics that Walmart would judge acquiring another brand, which is, is this making profit? And a lot of those brands aren't. What they are helping to do, of course, is build that Walmart marketplace out and expand its use and bring in more customers. Yeah. But it, again, it's a different, uh, a different measure of success than those would be used to. And it sounds like some of those might be sold off. The other thing I heard, which which wasn't mentioned in this article, was that um, Mark wanted to have a stronger team of essentially kind of senior upper upper management underneath him that he was essentially getting by acquiring Bonobos and ModCloth and these companies. He was he was getting the value of SKUs and and inventory and 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 things like that in in key specialized. Um, e-commerce areas, but he was also building out his bench of execs to help him go and execute, which I can see. You know, they didn't spend that much money. Like I think they said they're going to sell off mod cloth. They spent less than fifty million dollars in the grand scheme of things. I don't think, certainly compared to the billion dollars in losses. But here's my thing, and I would agree with you. You give Amazon a twenty-two year head start. <laughs> what do you expect? To, I mean, what do you expect to spend? Well, I mean, if you look at how much Amazon was losing, right, for 15 years, everyone was saying, oh, Amazon's losing money, losing money, losing money. I mean, what do you expect that you're going to buy this business and then overnight you're going to have break even? I mean, a billion dollars off of Walmart's, um, I think, close to five hundred billion dollars in in total throughput uh, of, of their linear revenue, which would be the, the large majority. Um, and then I think this article was saying that they had between 10 and 10 and $20 billion, um, in revenue from, from the marketplace or from jet, something like that. I don't see that as that. I mean, I, I can understand why they're traditional investors, right? The hedge funds, um, get scared by that and they want visibility on when that's going to end. And, and I think Doug said that he may be it's taking longer than he expected. So 
it's kind of on him to set investor expectations properly. But it, it, if if Walmart can do this successfully and become the number two, so it's definitely a winner take all dynamic in e commerce. Amazon has, I think, fifty percent of e commerce sales. Well, they, they uh, influenced that number lower with the latest study where they gave private data, but that's a whole other conversation. But at, so at least somewhere, 50%, somewhere between thirty five to fifty percent would be a rough a uh, rough estimate. They have um, ten percent of overall just retail in in the U.S. Is that right? Or maybe it's five percent between it's five and ten percent. Five percent in retail. And if so, it's definitely a winner take all dynamic. I think winner take most. And actually, Doug McMillan has said the same thing. There's going to be one or two dominant winners. It's definitely going to be Amazon in the number one slot. To me, the question of who's the number two. And I think if Walmart can be the number two overall general winner, um, Walmart will go down as the best transformation story in the past 50 years. There'll probably be like 10 HBR case studies written about them. Yeah, I think it was the, the ironically, the former CEO of Toys R Us, uh, now bankrupt, that said that if Walmart gets this right, there will be only two big winners in online in the next 20 years in the sort of general retail space, and that would be Walmart and Amazon. So this is definitely a, a strong winner take all or winner take most dynamic here. And Walmart has a big opportunity to go after, but it, it's natural that people in the core business who've been operating uh, a different way for many years and being very successful at doing that, obviously, are. Uh, resistant to this kind of change, and part of it part of it is the success of the business, uh, proving it itself, and the other part of it is bringing in new people and setting the expectations right from the top that this is how we're going to do things and this is an important initiative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. The the last note on this, and then we'll keep moving. Is there's definitely somewhere in here that the marketplace, the ecom stuff is between 10 and 20 billion in, in, I think the number I saw was about 21, 21, 21 billion in revenue and a billion in losses. Now here's the thing. 21 billion in revenue is revenue. That's not GMV. So that means that they, I don't know what the ratio is. I'm sure it's probably definitely a large majority is still linear revenue, Walmart buying and reselling, but there's gotta be some portion of that 21 billion even if it's 10%, right? Even if it's $2 billion in revenue, and if Walmart has a 10% take rate, just making up numbers here, um, that means that on a 10% take rate to get $2 billion in, in marketplace revenue, that means Walmart or Jet, whatever you want to you know, classify it as, is doing an additional $20 billion in GMV, which would, or in marketplace GMV, which means the total GMV for Ecom Walmart would be 40 billion. Now, I don't know what that ratio is of 21 billion. What's what subsect of that is take rate revenue from a marketplace? But if it's 5%, then it's 10 billion of additional GMV that's not being factored into that $21 billion. There's definitely a good amount of GMV or a, a small but growing amount of GMV uh, from Walmart's Ecom and Jet stuff. That, that I don't think anyone's reporting on that. Yeah, I don't think they disclose that. I think it, it's uh, growing. I think uh, what you've seen is them really emerge as the number two player. I think in market share, they might still be just behind eBay uh, overall, but eBay has been pretty stagnant in terms of size for a number of years. So it's, it's very likely going to overtake them in the next couple of years and be, emerge as really the very clear number two. Yeah, eBay's got about $95 billion in GMV. I was just looking that up before. Um, and I'm looking at uh, Jeff Bezos's. Um, Letter to shareholders came out April of 2019 about the 2018 annual report. And there's a great line in here where he's talking about um, Amazon will be experimenting at the right scale for a company of our size. If we occasionally have multi multi billion dollar failures, that was pretty awesome. Um, He's done a very good job of, of setting expectations properly. And the other really cool thing from this was. For the first time, they really broke down uh, the in, the impact of the marketplace on the overall business and showing it over about twenty year period of time, going from three percent in nineteen ninety nine to fifty eight percent in twenty eighteen of the overall G, overall GMV 
right. of what's being sold on Amazon is now coming from the third party seller marketplace, which is pretty impressive. Yeah, it's been a pretty uh, incredible growth story. I don't think they actually launched the Amazon marketplace formally until after the company went public by a year or two. And then since then, it's really been a key part of that growth story for them in retail. Yeah, love it. Um, good. The good thing for Walmart is that this article just came out um, a couple of days ago about how they bought Flipkart for about $16 billion in India, one of the leading uh, marketplaces in India. And, and, and this is what platforms are so good at is when, when a platform gets to scale, they basically become a massive VC new business incubation engine, um, which we're going to talk about more in a second. But um, what Flipkart did is they created their own payment platform, kind of like what eBay did back in the day with PayPal. And or no, that, yeah, or no, eBay they bought, acquired, they eBay, bought eBay PayPal. acquired PayPal and uh, Flipkart had bought this small mm. at the time mobile wallet business, which is basically a pay TM competitor called uh, phone pay F- phone P E. I don't know. And over the last couple of years, this business has grown enormously in India. They had this event that they call demonetization, where basically the government took a lot of cash out of circulation. And that really boosted mobile wallets. I think the biggest winner there is still Paytm, but the phone pay has been catching up very quickly and is now looking at raising uh, a large sum of money, potentially spinning out separately. It's something I think like a $10 billion valuation. Yep, $10 billion valuation, raising up to a billion dollars uh, with Walmart being you know, the large majority owner. It says they were considering whether Walmart should fund this internally or, or let this be spun out because they are the whole owner of, you know, wholly owned... Um, Flipkart's a wholly owned subsidiary of, of Walmart. So it, I thought that was very cool. I, don't, I wonder if this, this couldn't have even been properly priced into the acquisition um, because I don't think Flipkart is worth, even if, even if this was worth five billion, you know, half the price a year ago when they bought it, um, it I don't think they're paying just 10 or $11 billion for Flipkart. I think this business has grown enormously over the last two years, and this has been basically part of the success story of that acquisition early on is that this uh, has come out of that. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so about six weeks ago, uh, this cool little company, not little, I'm kidding, uh, the biggest ETF company in the world, uh, independent ETF company, they've got about $60 billion under management called Wisdom Tree. Uh, launched the world's first uh, index on platform businesses. And uh, that came out the end of May. And the cool thing is that the PLAT index here, uh, P-L-A-T, has about 69 public platform company stocks in it. These are all of the public platform stocks that have over a $2 billion market cap globally. Um, and this is the first of its kind. There's no other basket of companies. There's, there's no other, uh, easy way to say, Hey, if platforms are the dominant business model out there, which they are, um, how could I take advantage of that? How could I, uh, bring that into my portfolio? A lot of people have asked us that over the years. This is a question we got a lot, uh, around the time that the book came out in 2016. So someone read the book would say, great. I agree with you. This is the dominant business model. How do I go invest in that? Uh, particularly a lot of people, you know, hedge funds and investment advisors. And the answer was really, there isn't a way. There's you know, a handful of these companies out there, but no one had really created a systematic way for you to bet on this as an asset class. Mm-hmm. So the year-to-date performance on the index is about 6.95%. And when I compare, you know, I compare some comparables. You know, I look at the QQQ, which is the NASDAQ 100. I look at um, IYW, which is the largest tech sector ETF. Uh, So that has linear SaaS companies in it, like an Oracle, Um, maybe Netflix, I don't know, and uh, and platform companies. And we look at which one is doing better and um, Platt's beating them so far. I mean, we only have six or seven weeks of data, but so far, You know, I think the thesis and our thesis when writing the book was that these are the dominant business models. And that means that they are going to continue to outperform the market over the next five to 10 years. And I think a lot of value investors have really been perplexed 
by that in the sense of um, how have even the large cap tech stocks, the FAMGAs, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Apple, continued to outperform the market over the past 10 years, even though they've been public for a long time. Um, I was just speaking with an analyst and a group of investors about this a week or two ago. And the question really was, okay, is these profit margins for these platform companies are so high. Is this going to continue? Is this realistic? And the answer in short was yes, because this is a different business model. You have to understand uh, this operates in a different way than the traditional kind of businesses you're used to. And that means the financial performance is going to be different. Yeah. And, and, and I think, and, and what that goes back to is look at Facebook, look at Google, look at Apple, Amazon, et cetera. What, when they have a dominant platform, so for Amazon, that's the marketplace. Uh, for Facebook, that's the, you know, the initial Facebook social network. What these companies start to become are massive new business incubation engines. And they have teams and teams and teams and teams. And then they actually start to label these things like Google X, you know, their startup factories. And, and basically what they're doing is becoming platform conglomerates. And what they're doing is stacking platform business on top, on top of platform business. And they're taking one or both sides of their existing ecosystem and using that to uh, move into other adjacent or complementary platform models. How would you describe that? Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting because it's very different than how you're used to typical businesses expanding in terms of vertical or horizontal uh, integration. It kind of defies that type of categorization. Really what it is, is I'm a platform. I have one side of the network, whether that's consumers or producers, that also overlaps with this other kind of core transaction where they would fulfill one side of that network. And I'm going to use this existing network I have and this user base to rotate into that other core transaction. So that's Uber going into Uber Eats. That's Facebook going from college students to celebrities, businesses and content creators. Uh, that's Google going from search to use that to really juice YouTube and then now uh, you know, trying to do shopping, all kinds of other things. Yeah, Google, Google Docs. Um, I mean, they had Google Video and then they bought YouTube. Google Maps. Um, so it's, it's very, very cool. And I think that really, to me, is, is an easy way to understand how large cap tech stocks, which are basically all platforms except for Netflix, um, are able to continue to outperform the market. And I think will continue to outperform the market over the next five to 10 years. Look at why Microsoft is now the most valuable tech company in the world. It's because of Azure and then the development platform that they have on top of Azure that they've really been able to then use. And um, the way that uh, Satya describes this is that the, pr the producers, the common producer thread throughout all the platforms are their developers. Right. And their developers can now build um, apps for Azure. They can build apps for um, the operating system. They can, um, you know, uh, uh, for the Surface. And, and, and he has been so laser focused on, on that alignment. Um, let me see if I can find that it's little the, chart the of old his. Steve Bomber line. Developers, 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 developers. Yeah, but you got to say it with a little more enthusiasm and sweat a lot. And then <laughs> uh, you've, you've got it on lock. And then you invest in Windows Phone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that was what Bill Gates said. That was their only, you know, big, the big miss. Yeah. That they should have owned that. Um, but let's keep on the stud, right? That's one mechanism. You have a dominant platform business. You know, how, how are you capturing platform value over the next 10 or 20 years? We've seen you have one dominant. Uber is a great example, right? Just went public. Um, still losing a bunch of money on ride sharing, but are already now expanding. I mean, it kind of seems the same, but it's very different having a delivery business ver delivering food or versus people. But they were able to use drivers and consumers to then build, essentially bring parts of a two-sided ecosystem to Uber Eats and juice that. And it's a thing of beauty, I think. Right. And U Uber Eats really is three-sided where you have the restaurants mm, that needed to get. Great point. You have the drivers and then the customers. And they already have the drivers and customers. Let's just connect them in a slightly different context. It's still logistics, moving stuff from point A to point B. We're just moving food rather than people. And then they had to add the food supply, which is the restaurants. And I think now in a lot of cities, they're up there with Seamless, uh, Grubhub, uh, and DoorDash is the other one that's got a lot of funding behind it as kind of the dominant players in this industry, certainly in the U.S. And so the other way to capture platform value would be 
Um, so you, you start a startup, right? I start a startup from scratch. I get money from VCs and I build my new platform business. Problem is, um, well, why, why that mechanism is not going to be that fruitful, I think, over the next uh, at least few years. Um, there are two kind of foundational platforms that a lot of startups have been built on over the past 20 years. One would be the internet, which is kind of decentralized and isn't necessarily a platform owned by anyone, but there are a lot of um, development platform dynamics that let you create a website and then connect to consumers through this thing called the internet, as well as uh, browsers like Chrome and other things. So you've seen a lot of new startup innovation, new startup creation, on the heels of the internet and then subsequently smartphones. Um, and basically what you can see is that uh, over the past few years, we've still seen VC investment increase overall. We've still seen the over amount of money being put into startups increasing. The problem is the number of deals is decreasing. And really, we would attribute this to mega fundraisers, right? The SoftBank, right. these mega, you know, uh, multi-hundred million dollar deals, sometimes multi-billion dollar investments, um, which are considered VC, but probably shouldn't be considered VC. Well, you have a lot of uh, non-traditional VC investors, private equity companies, hedge funds, sovereign wealth funds that are piling into those late stages. So it's a very different dynamic than early stage VC funding has traditionally been. And so while you have the amount of money might increase, as you said, that number of early stage deals, essentially new companies being funded, uh, has actually declined year over year if you're looking at the last few years. Right. And, and to that extent, there are so many VCs that will say, oh, Amazon could get into this space or Uber could go, you know, or, or Amazon's getting into food delivery or Uber is... I don't want to, I don't want to invest in this space, right? So if mechanism one is to capture platforms is I, I, I create a platform startup and I need to get money from VCs. Mechanism two is I have a dominant platform business and I'm going to now expand into a complementary platform area like we see with the large tech monopolies. Um, that means mechanism one doesn't want to compete with mechanism two, which bodes pretty well for mechanism two if you're a large tech monopoly that the VCs just don't even want to be in that game with you. So where does that leave us? What's door number three? Door number three, mechanism number three, is essentially going back to this threat of Walmart, going back to this idea that you have a linear company, not a platform company, a traditional linear company, and you say, could I do something similar to mechanism two, right? If I have a large tech monopoly that's moving into complementary platform markets, I'm a, I'm a large linear company. How could I use my advantages, parts of my network or my ecosystem or, or other advantages to do something similar and move into a platform model or start a platform business or spin out a platform business rather, or buy a platform startup and supercharge it. And some examples that we've seen from that would be um, Amazon being the original example. They were a linear bookseller for many, many, many years. And, and they only started uh, actually becoming a marketplace, when's, when's Jeff's note? 99. It started, it founded in 94 is when he actually started saying we had 3% marketplace and you know, the, contribution. The, the official, what they call Amazon Marketplace 2 didn't launch, I think it was in 2000 that it actually launched publicly. So I don't know where you got 3%, but... Um, Anyway, eventually they had enough demand that they could truly launch the marketplace right. and, and actually attract sellers, which would say, hey, this is worth my while to go list product and, and give Amazon a cut and sell products on, on Amazon's marketplace. Um, other great examples of this would be Salesforce. Uh, it, uh, Salesforce is in uh, the Platt Index. Not many people know Salesforce is doing about a billion dollars in revenue from their app marketplace. Um, they do about $10 billion in revenue top line. That billion dollars in revenue from the app marketplace, though, I think accounts for over a third of Salesforce's net income. The, the other interesting part about that, too, if you look through their you know, investor presentations and financials, they actually say, here are the market opportunities, we think, in the different lines of our business and what they call the Salesforce platform, 
of which this app marketplace is a substantial part, is by far the largest opportunity that they have in terms of growth, even beyond their kind of core traditional SaaS business. Right. There are multiple public companies that literally got their start making apps for Salesforce. Uh, it's a thing of beauty, right? Um, it's what we saw with the iPhone, just in a, in a, in a smaller, more niche example, the Salesforce doesn't have its own operating system and interface. You know, it's not as, as big of a development platform. Uh, it's what we would call between a closed versus controlled development platform. <laughs> we won't get into that today. Um, Expedia is another example of being linear, buying a lot of hotel inventory in the future and then reselling it. And now is moving more towards a marketplace. Right. What you saw with Expedia is their big competitor booking, uh, did very well internationally with what they call the agency model, which is basically the traditional marketplace model where you don't own the underlying inventory. You really just facilitate the transaction. Whereas where Expedia traditionally operates is what they call the merchant model in the hotel business, which is basically we buy a bunch of inventory up front and are reselling it. Mm. So there's a lot of that inventory and balance sheet risk that goes with that. It's a very different model. And uh, you have a little bit more control and you can get more times uh, and early on. When this was uh, not as well developed in industry, that worked really well, particularly in the U.S. where Expedia was based. But you've seen this agency model really take over uh, and booking greatly supersede Expedia over the last 10 or so years. So Expedia has really transitioned and said, all right, we're going to move toward this agency model, which today I think makes now uh, gone from a few percentage points, you know, five, 10 years ago to now about 40 percent of their revenue is actually from this marketplace, true marketplace model versus kind of this traditional reseller mm -hmm. model they've operated under. And who did that? Our friend Dara, now the CEO of Uber. Um, interesting note about Expedia, it's basically owned by Barry Diller from IAC. Barry Diller gets platforms very well, um, with, whether it's uh, uh, Tinder and Match.com. Match and what was the other one? You Match Group, which owns Match Group. Tinder, Match. Yeah. Plenty of fish, I think, and probably five or so other dating platforms. And now they're doing roll up what with like Angie's List, Handy, um, and uh, one of the other kind of like home service marketplaces that I'm right. blanking on. I kind of like Marketplace 1.0 for home services. He's great. He gets it um, and, and is doing a lot of cool things with platforms. And if you can't, so if you can't build it from scratch, you can buy it. And there's a bunch of examples about companies buying platforms. Golf Channel is probably one of my favorite. Uh, golf Channel bought this thing called Golf Now, which lets you book a tee time at a public golf course. And um, what's beautiful about that is every time you're watching the Golf Channel, you'll see an ad that says, hey, go book some golf at, on Golf Now. And it's a great way, great example of look at all this latent demand that I have in my media business. And how could I then channel that demand to this marketplace that I own. And now Golf Now is easily the dominant winner take all business to book a tee time. Uh, the PGA has recently tried to um, you know, have a competitor, but, I, but PGA doesn't have such a dominant linear business to just funnel demand into the marketplace that, that Golf Now does. Um, other examples would be uh, Conde Nast buying Reddit many, many years ago. We'll talk about that in another show. Um, Target buying shipped, a little bit different approach, but whatever. Um, so they have a lot of advantages, these traditional businesses, to, uh, to make this happen. Anyway, these three mechanisms, you know, the third one being linear companies moving into platforms, uh, is what I see, we see, as a huge untapped opportunity over the next 20 years, I would say. Um, and I think some of the private equity companies will slowly get into it. Um, but, uh, I don't know. We'll see where it goes. You're, you're seeing a lot of industries too, that are, uh, we're discovering them are more kind of off, uh, off bounds for startups being really huge successes or disruptive successes. The way the Ubers, uh, Lyfts and Airbnbs have been things like healthcare and finance, where the incumbent players are very entrenched, have enough market share and have regulation in many cases that are protecting them that. The startup approach, that sort of first way funded by VC that has been successful for the last 15 or 20 years, isn't likely to crack that nut anytime soon. So that this idea is either going to be the big tech companies, which are starting to see now, Amazon getting heavily or starting to get heavily into both financial services and mm -hmm. healthcare. Apple definitely in healthcare, and you're starting to see them look at financial services. You've seen this play out in Asia with 
uh, Alibaba, uh, uh, Ant Financial, which spun out of there, and a number of other companies, Gojek, uh, in Southeast Asia, starting to follow a similar path, uh, spitting out GoPay and their own financial services arm. Mm-hmm. So th- these kinds of uh, areas are going to be off limits to the traditional startups to be really huge successes. And it's going to be either the linear companies that are incumbents that are able to successfully spin out their own platforms, or the big tech companies that are going to come in and launch their own platforms into this based off their existing businesses. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well. That's it for us today. This is the inaugural uh, episode of Winner Take All. Thanks for joining us, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Seacrest out.